What is going on, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back today to do a little filmography review or resume review of director Adrian Lyne because for the first time in 20 years, he has a movie coming out next week on Hulu, Deep Water, starring Ana de Armas and Ben Affleck. Obviously, big celebrity couple, at least for a brief time. But from my point of view, there are a lot of reasons to get excited about Deep Water. First and foremost, it's based on a novel by Patricia Highsmith. Obviously, tons of her novels have been turned into classic movies going back 60, 70 years. The screenplay was by Zach Helm and Sam Levinson. Obviously, Sam Levinson has really exploded recently with the popularity of the show Euphoria. But from my point of view, the biggest reason to get excited is that we're finally getting an adult drama full of sex and violence, basically a sexual thriller, a type of film that's basically become an endangered species in recent years. And I think one of the reasons that it's become an endangered species is because Adrian Lyne has not been making movies. For people who don't know who Adrian Lyne is, in the 80s, the 90s, and up basically until about 2002, he made a lot of the most famous kind of sexual adult dramas and thrillers of those periods, and a lot of them were absolute smash hits. And I don't know enough about his career to know why he took this 20-year hiatus. He's in his early 80s now. But there's a period when I was growing up where pretty much every movie he made felt like this massive event. And I'm not quite sure why Hollywood's not that interested in making these kinds of movies anymore because they're not super expensive to make. And when they hit, they hit big. I mean, perfect example, a movie like Indecent Proposal had a budget of around $40 million and then grossed well over $200 million. No matter what Hollywood claims they stand for, their love of money is always first and foremost in their list of priorities. And so it's strange for me that they would completely abandon those kinds of movies in favor of animation for kids or superheroes, whatever the case might be. So I'm really hoping that Deep Water will be a return to form. But for people out there who are younger than I am, today I'm just going to go through the eight movies he's directed so people know what that form is. And ordinarily, when looking at the career of a director, I would write out a top 10 list. But with only eight feature films, I can't really do a top 10 list. And also, people seem to react very favorably to my recent Batman review where I didn't write out the review. I just kind of bullshitted my way through it. So that's what I'm going to try and do today. So I'm not going to talk about his first two shorts, The Table and Mr. Smith from the 1970s, because I haven't seen them. But let's talk about the very first feature film that he ever made, Foxes from 1980, starring the great Jodie Foster. And rounding out the rest of the cast, we have Cherie Curry from The Runaways. we got Sally Kellerman, R.I.P. We've got Randy Quaid. And we also have a very young Scott Bayo, who was right in the middle of the hit show Happy Days at the time this movie was made. And fun fact, there's a massive skateboarding chase sequence in this movie that beat Back to the Future to the punch by a good five years. But as far as what this movie's about, in a lot of ways, it's a warm-up for a lot of the themes that would preoccupy Adrian Lyne throughout all of his movies. But it's basically a coming-of-age drama of four teenage girls living in the valley in the late 70s, early 80s. And while there's not much plot to speak of, there's tons of drinking and concerts and screwing around and wild parties and violence and so on and so forth. And it's always a weird thing for me seeing movies from my childhood that I did not see when I was a child. But in a strange way, the movie made me incredibly sentimental about this era that I can barely remember. I was four years old when this movie came out. But there's an undeniable emotional power to the movie. And it's kind of hard to find these days. The only version I was able to find was on YouTube. And the transfer is pretty good. But if coming-of-age dramas with plenty of hell-raising sound like your thing, definitely check out Foxes. But in 1983, we get Adrian Lyne's first monster smash hit, Flashdance, a movie that still has a cultural ripple effect because to this day, anytime someone hears a song like She's a Maniac or Gloria, there's a very good chance they're going to remember the incredibly elaborate dancing and ice skating and just workout sequences from this movie. And this is another movie that's a little light on plot. All you really need to know is that it's about a factory girl played by Jennifer Beals who wants to be a dancer. But there's certain movies out there that just scream 80s culture, and Flashdance is absolutely one of those. It was produced by Peter Goober and John Peters. One of the screenwriters was Joe Esterhaus. And it's just a wild, lurid, kick-ass good time from start to finish. It has some really cool early breakdancing sequences. A lot of people like to point to like Beach Street and Breakin' as some of the great early breakdance movies. But the sidewalk sequence on Flashdance is one of the best breakdance sequences I've ever seen. And we also get that killer backspin at the end of the movie when she's finally getting her big audition. But it's with Flash Ants that we see that Adrian Lyne is starting to veer into much more adult drama where he's totally fine with nudity, he's totally comfortable with libidinous lifestyles, sin and vice, etc. And that includes foot jobs under the table during dinner sequences and people talking about fucking each other's brains out. It's the kind of frank dialogue that's largely absent from a lot of Hollywood movies these days, so Flash Dance is definitely worth revisiting for anybody who's never seen it. And in 1986, we get one of Adrian Lyne's most notorious films, the legendary, the great nine and a half weeks starring Kim Basinger and Mickey Rourke. 
Now, I'm not going to go to the mat defending this movie because I feel like there's a lot about this movie that's totally ridiculous, namely the complete absence of anything resembling a story or a plot. However, what the movie does have are these like sexual escapades and like music video sequences that are just awe-inspiring. Like a weird, random, violent chase through the streets in New York that suddenly ends up with this giant makeout scene down at the bottom of this dirty stairwell as rain is pouring down upon them. In terms of the lighting and the music and great-looking actors, the sex appeal of this movie is just completely through the roof. And so when people remember Nine and a Half Weeks fondly, what they remember are these great sequences with like ice cubes or these elaborate dance sequences that Kim Basinger does for Mickey Rourke's amusement. It is absolutely 100% worth watching, but for people out there who think that movies need to adhere to a traditional three-act structure, let's just say nine and a half weeks falls short on that front. But the fact that the movie is remembered so fondly 35 years later as one of the great erotic movies that has ever come out of Hollywood tells you all you need to know. But let's move on to one of Adrian Lyne's biggest successes, and this is actually the first Adrian Lyne movie that I ever saw, Fatal Attraction from 1987. This movie was just a fucking smash when it came out, and I can still vividly recall hearing my parents and their friends coming back from seeing it and discussing it in this incredibly animated fashion. I could tell it was one of those movies that just made feel like they had lightning bolts running through their body. So inevitably, a good friend of mine and I decided we needed to see this. However, there was a problem. We were in fifth grade. We were 11 years old. And the only way we were going to be able to see it was by sneaking in. And just to set the stage, I need to give you some context. I was living in Greensboro, North Carolina at the time, and near my neighborhood, there was this one-two punch where all the where all the teenagers liked to hang out. There was a McDonald's, and then across the street, there was a theater called The Janus. And The Janus was kind of a crummy theater, but just something about having a movie theater and a McDonald's, it became the notorious like teenage hangout. Like Years later, when I was 15, the very first time I smoked pot was behind The Janus. A lot of people had a lot of their big, formative teenage experiences there. And a lot of kids would get punished or grounded if they were even seen hanging out near the Janus. Like a lot of kids were forbidden to go to that area unattended. But my friend and I, I think we bought tickets for like Beetlejuice or something else that we could get into. And then we managed to sneak into this kind of plush upstairs theater that was, I think it was called the Cinnabar Lounge. But it was notorious because it had these like big like couches and like plush chairs. It was almost kind of engineered in a way to be like a like a teenage makeout spot. And when this movie got started, there were plenty of adults in the audience that were making out all around us. But my friend and I, we were just absolutely enthralled by this because A, it's a very sexually explicit movie about an affair that goes horribly, horribly wrong. But it's also just a dynamite thriller featuring some incredible performances by Michael Douglas, Glenn Close, and Ann Archer. And I recently revisited the movie and it absolutely holds up. But it made me kind of sad thinking back to the fact that in 1987, a really lurid sexual thriller could be a monster runaway smash success. Name the last time you saw a movie in the theater that generated a massive box office that falls in that category. I guess the Fifty Shades of Grey movies would be the last example I could think of. And those movies made hundreds of millions of dollars. But those movies are terrible, whereas Fatal Attraction is good. So my hope, given the description of Deep Water, is that Deep Water is going to be returned to Fatal Attraction territory. But moving on to 1990, we have my favorite movie by Adrian Lyne, Jacob's Ladder, one of the coolest supernatural horror movies from my childhood. And basically, I think from any era, I think it holds up really well. There was a really stupid remake one or two years ago, which encouraged me to go back and revisit the movie, and I was blown away all over again. But I can vividly recall a bunch of like 13, 14-year-old kids all going to the theater to see this. And we had no idea what it was about, but we'd seen the trailers on TV, so we had an idea there'd be something demonic or kind of disturbing about it. And the movie just absolutely delivered a hundred times over. There was just something in the water at this time where these kinds of movies were thriving. Like Alan Parker was making movies like Angel Heart. I feel like Angel Heart and Jacob's Ladder make a great double feature. But Tim Robbins has never been better. Elizabeth Payne has never been better. Danny Aiello's never been better. And I feel like this movie in a lot of ways is a master class of having in-camera special effects. They're not being added on a computer after the fact. These are costumes and props and special effects that are captured then and there. And then through the magic of this kind of sleight of hand, really sophisticated editing style, they shave off frames here and there. So you never quite know what you're seeing, but your imagination just fills in the gaps. But this is one of those movies where you quite literally feel like you've been to hell and back by the end of it. And because it's an Adrian Lyne movie, it's also very erotic along the way. But let's move on to 1993, An Indecent Proposal. 
maybe my least favorite movie by Adrian Lyne, but this movie was just a runaway smash hit, a cultural sensation when it came out. And I revisited it a couple of days ago, and it almost seems quaint and old-fashioned by today's standards, but it's in one of these classic scenarios where a down-on-their-luck couple played by Woody Harrelson and Demi Moore gets offered a million dollars if Demi Moore will spend the evening with Robert Redford. And Robert Redford at this point was still like in his mid-late 50s, was still a Hollywood heartthrob. And while this movie might have overpromised and then underdelivered on the sex, people need to keep in mind what a massive star Demi Moore was at this time. I mean, she was coming off movies like Ghost and A Few Good Men, and she was just like a giant celebrity, you know, posing nude on the covers of like Vanity Fair with like body makeup and then posing when she was pregnant. I mean, everybody was just obsessed with Demi Moore. So for her to do this movie where she gets, you know, basically bribed into having sex with Robert Redford, which most women would probably do for free, it just generated a lot of headlines. And like I said, on a budget of $38 million, it grossed 266 worldwide. And then pretty much all of that goodwill was used up and spent by Adrian Lyne on his next movie, Lolita, the biggest flop of his career by far. He regards it as his best movie. It came out in 1997. It got delayed due to a lot of problems finding distribution. But what can I say about Lolita? Obviously, very scandalous topic that you can... You know, people freak out even the, discussing the premise. But I've read Vladimir Nabokov's novel, and I've seen Stanley Kubrick's original movie from the 60s many times over. But there's no getting around it. This is a movie about a pedophile, but it's a pedophile depicted in a human way where initially you might be repulsed by him, but in a strange way you slowly, slowly but surely feel a strange sense of pity for him by the end. And I know that Adrian Lyne was really trying hard to really get to the spirit and the tone of the novel with this a, in a way where he felt like Stanley Kubrick's movie was kind of lacking. I actually kind of prefer the weird devilish qualities of Kubrick's movie, probably because Peter Sellers is just so game and so delightful, and he just really goes for it and if you're not going to tackle Claire Quilty in a way that's exciting and provocative, a lot of the kind of fun, devilish energy of the movie gets sapped out. And as great an actor as Frank Langella might be, I just wasn't completely on board with what Adrian Lyne and what Frank Langella decided to do with, with the character of Claire Quilty. That said, Jeremy Irons is incredible in his voiceover narration. I know he did a, uh, an audiobook of Lolita at one point, and apparently that's just uh, astonishing to listen to but he has voiceover from the text throughout the movie. And I think what this movie has that the Kubrick film lacks is an explanation as to how he became the way he is. Basically, this teenage romance when he was a very young child and this girl where they, you know, they basically they fell in love over the, over the matter over the course of a summer and then she suddenly died. And ever since then, he's been kind of trying to recapture and rekindle and rediscover that teenage love affair that ended so tragically. And just to give you an idea of how big a flop this movie was at that time, on a $62 million budget, the movie grossed $1.1 million. I mean, that is an absolute train wreck in terms of performance. And Jeremy Irons worried that this movie would be pretty radioactive and hurt his career. But to his credit, he and Dominic Swain... They just went for it. And Dominic Swain's pretty goddamn good in it as well. I mean, all that stuff when she's messing around with her bubble gum and her retainer, it's a delightful performance. And so I have no problem understanding why this movie was a giant flop. I have no problem understanding why it was hard for this film to find distribution. But I do think it's worth seeing. I saw it in the theater when it came out, and it's available now on Apple TV Plus for people who are curious. Like I said, Adrian Lyne regards it as his finest movie. I do not agree. I think his finest is Jacob's Ladder. But if you're curious about his career, you've got to check this out to have a complete understanding of what Adrian Lyne is all about. And finally, we come to Adrian Lyne's most recent movie, Unfaithful, from 2002. And it's funny how when this movie came out, I was like 25, 26, and Diane Lane was in her late 30s. And it was regarded as like this scandalous sexual drama where she's having an affair with a younger man and an affair that goes horribly wrong. And everybody was acting like she was like... 80 years old or something, but now at age 45, I'm like, 37, that's young. I mean, if you watch the movie now, like, oh yeah, Diane Lane, she's an absolute sex machine. I mean, she looks absolutely fantastic, but it's so funny how perceptions of age change in your own life over time, but also just by the industry, in, in the industry at large. 
but this was a remake of a Claude Chabrol film, and I think it's pretty damn solid. It's not as good as something like Fatal Attraction, but the erotic scenes, those work really well, where Diane Lane just holds nothing back. And apparently Adrienne Lyne prepared her for the movie by showing her and her co-star, Olivier Martinez, uh, screenings of Fatal Attraction. But they called it a special sex summit, where he basically was showing the now legendary scene of Michael Douglas and Glenn Close getting it on in the kitchen. And anyway, that's a pretty outrageous scene that I remember people just howling with laughter in the theater at the time. But there's a quote by Diane Lane where she says, He took us into his trailer and gave us a good talking to, like children that were not going to get into college if we didn't pass the test. He was saying how important it is for the actors to trust them and to go well beyond their comfort level. That's what he requires. I trusted Adrian completely. I told him, I'll give you everything on film, and then when you edit it together, I can see what I'm comfortable with. I'll trust you first, and then you have to trust me later. Fortunately, he chose wisely in the editing room. I was very comfortable with the end result. It was all appropriate to the story. So all's well that ends well. Seemed like Diane Lane's performance was universally uh, kind of praised or acknowledged. She got nominated for an Oscar. She got nominated for a Golden Globe. And then we entered this cold patch where from his early 60s to his early 80s, Adrian Lyne doesn't make any more movies. And I don't know if that's because the culture in Hollywood changed because in the early 2000s, obviously, you've got the Lord of the Rings movies and you've got the Harry Potter movies and you've got the beginning of the superhero craze. And Hollywood is starting to realize, like, why should we make these kind of risque dramas for adults when we can make vast sums of money kind of making movies for a much more innocent sensibility? And obviously... The market's very complex in terms of what the audience wants and what Hollywood wants, but there's no denying the money that's been generated from this new emphasis on Hollywood being a dream factory of escapist entertainment. But I do think there's always a role for challenging, provocative adult entertainment. And I'm thrilled that Hulu, which is a part of Disney, is getting behind this movie. So I just hope it's not an absolute train wreck because Ana de Armas, she's an awesome actress and really cool movie star and been doing great work now for about 10 years and I would just love to see her deliver a performance that gets the same level of acclaim that Glenn Close got for Fatal Attraction or that Diane Lane got for Unfaithful so we'll see how much gas is left in the tank of Adrian Lyne I'm a little biased because obviously I want this movie to do well but I will be watching it and reviewing it next week so I hope you enjoyed this flashback review of Adrian Lyne's career if I were to make some recommendations to people who are totally unfamiliar with his work of his eight movies, Flashdance is just an absolute blast. You'll be dancing around your home. Fatal Attraction is a very satisfying thriller. Jacob's Ladder is a very cool horror movie. Those would probably be my three favorite. But once again, Adrian Lyne regards Lolita as his finest. Everybody can make up their own minds. I applaud anybody who tackles that kind of material. I just feel like the book and Stanley Kubrick's movie or better, but that's just one man's opinion. Some people out there might disagree. And if you just want to get your rocks off, nine and a half weeks will deliver every time. <laughs> so on that note, I'm going to wrap up this sucker. Hunt me down on Twitter at Geekin' Out. And please remember to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell to be notified about future content. And can't thank you enough for watching, but more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.